Okay. So we are going live. Uh, we've got more people rushing in the door for this session. Uh, this is Tokioki pop-up talk show. It's a free-form kind of chat, um, loosely based around the idea of the future of sequencing. What does that mean to you? We can take it in any direction you want to take it in. Um, it could be the application of sequencing. It could be the technology of sequencing. It could be about the data. We're not scared to talk about data here on Tokioki. Um, we went deep into it yesterday. It's kind of up to you where you want to take this discussion. Uh, my name is Mikey. This is Tokioki. Um, we're talking about the future of sequencing. Um, there's already um, a gambit of an opening session for this. Um, t starting from 10 years, the human genome to Oh, 10 years to, make, to sequence the human genome to 60 minutes now to sequence an entire human genome. So that's what we're talking about here. Uh, we've got SJO down the bottom. Can you tell us your name? Yeah, sorry. That's my business account, Mikey. It's Simon. <laughs> I'll change it around now. It always Simon, welcome. Um, so we're talking about the, f the future of sequencing. What is it going to be? Welcome, everybody. Anyone? want to kick us off to how do you see the future of sequencing um is it going to be like moore's law where you get this exponential growth or is it going to be um you know is it going to be more like um i, I think it's good i think it's gonna be more like growth. like huge steps forward you. oh i can't hear you that well hang on a sec let me turn you up a bit there rebecca what were you saying i think it i don't I think so far, as much as we would love it to be Moore's law, because the closer mm. we get to that, the more we get into, you know, sequences on our phones or in our, in our pockets. But mm. it does seem to be more based around the technology. So we had mm. the Illumina sequencing and then we went to nanopore sequencing where you mm. could do these single strands of DNA. Yeah. And that was a huge leap forward. And then from that, we got the oxid nanopore sequencing and the very tiny sequences. Can you tell us a little bit more about that for those who may not know about the Oxford Nanopore device? Yeah, of course. So uh, a bit of a clue is in the name uh, that yep. it's a nanopore. So you, what happens is it's a very mm. tiny hole, which means a single strand of DNA can be fed uh, through it. Yeah. And as it is fed through it, either by, I believe, fluorescent mm. lights or depending, the pore can sort of read what bases as come it comes through, through. Mm. and gives it gives you a very yeah. nice uh, readout. Okay, I mean, how I, you may not know this, and Oxford Nano. Please correct me. Yeah, come and tell us. But how do you thread a molecule through a tiny little hole? I have trouble, you know, threading a needle. So, uh, <laughs> how's it done? L lots of encouragement. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me find out for you because I, I I'm really interested in that. And I wouldn't want I wouldn't want to get it wrong because I know we've got a lot of scientists uh, watching. And, you know uh, what? That's it would be probably quite good to get it wrong. So then those scientists will come on and come and join the Zoom and tell us exactly, you know, exactly the right information. Sometimes, you know, getting it wrong sometimes is just a way to start the conversation. So uh, I wouldn't worry about it too much on Tokioki. Um, we've got another question here as well from you. Sequencing from birth. Um, it's up to you. Where do you want to take this? Anyone else want to jump in? Uh, Evie, have you got a point there? Yeah, can you guys hear me all right? Yes. Yeah, brilliant. Um, well, I was, um, I was thinking about the, the future of genome you know, um, sequencing. Um, I was reading quite an interesting article this morning about talking about the change and how um, it was actually more focused on vaccines. So it's still talking about the kind of cultural shift that's changed during the 80s, so when sort of uh, Thatcherism and Reaganism became a lot more popular, in, um, yeah. the regulatory bodies or the people who are making vaccines moved away from either independent government funded bodies and they started going into um, more sort of profit based or free market based companies. Um, yeah. And um, they, this, this writer was kind of paralleling that with a kind of like the change in trust between um, that it was also kind of followed a, a change in trust between people who um, trusted using vaccines or getting vaccinated um, with that decline and that kind of right. rise. Okay. So I wonder, um, 
yeah, if, if there were the future of genomic sequencing, whether it's something we have to bear in mind when um, you're thinking about fund, uh, how you fund this kind of science, um, do we need to make sure that we keep having a dialogue with the public? Because if we keep getting pushed away into sort of maybe more market forces, um, people maybe will become, a, in the same way that they're becoming anti-vaxxers, may become anti-sequencers. Right. Okay, will there be an anti-sequencing movement in the future? That's an interesting point. Um, uh, we've got a new face here. Tamsin, welcome. Uh, at the moment we're talking about the future of sequencing. We've just started, so we kind of, in a way, this is how Tokyoki works, especially at the Festival of Genomics. We come up with an idea, and then what do we want to talk about? Do we want to talk about the technology? Do we want to talk about the cultural implications? It's kind of up to you. So if you've got any sort of uh, any ideas about where you want to take this conversation, please do let us know. Um, do we want to talk about the technology? Do we want to talk about this idea that um, if we've got developments driven by uh, private companies, does that lead to a kind of paranoia? We talked about a little bit about this in the, on the first day when we talked about um, the question of trust and opening up uh, genomics to a more diverse audience but you know is it all about whether it's done by um, public institutions or private institutions does that matter up to you other people on this chat where do you want to take this conversation um, I, I would just like to say I found the answer for how nanopore okay. how the how the DNA and, our, and RNA shango through mm, it is yeah. um, with an electrical current so there is a membrane because DNA is negatively charged and you put right. positive ions through and it will oh, wow. okay. pull it through. Uh, sadly, we can't use that with thread and needles. Okay, yeah, why not? Because thread isn't electrically Could you not, could you not negatively charge your, your thread? And positively charge your needle and fusing bang. steel wire, I guess. Yeah, if you start, yeah, sure. I reckon we might have a, you know, going away from, uh, Going away from uh, DNA, we might have a little, you know, a little business idea there of like threading needles for those with bad eyesight. Um, we've got another new face, Jill. Welcome. We are talking about the future of DNA sequencing, but we're kind of deciding do we want to talk about technology? Do we want to talk about spin off ideas in the field of haberdashery? Do you want to talk about um, the cultural implications of DNA sequencing? Do you want to talk about its use, its application? It's kind of up to you. Uh, where do you want to take this conversation? And those people, I'm just going to quickly check what's happening on the Vimeo stream um, to find out if there's any thoughts on on there. Uh, um, and if you do, if you are watching on Vimeo, please, please do. Um, let us know where you want to take this conversation. And we've got two hours, so we can go to lots of, in lots of places. Um, right now, it's kind of up to you. Where do we, where do you want to take this? You want to talk about the culture? Simon. Um, yeah, hi, Mikey. Hello, everybody. Um, I guess I'm curious at the start. I'm quite ignorant of the actual technologically um, kind of aspect of it. So when Rebecca was talking then, I, I was amazed at what was being said, but not very au fait with what the, um, connotations are for real world applications so i guess like uh, the moral side of things is far more of far more interest to me but i would like to be more well versed in the technological side of it so that i'm able mm -hmm. to make a more informed uh, assessment of the moral side of things so i wonder what's the uh, obviously this is a huge question but i wonder what the, mm -hmm. the kind of current status quo is in terms of what where we're at with genetic sequencing and what it's kind of currently being used for and what maybe the short-term ambitions are for that um unless of course you've already covered this extensively and i'm wasting everybody's time um well it's covered extensively in the festival of genomics but at the same time we're absolutely i think everyone within genomics would like people to know a bit more about the technology and you know there's different fields as well within genomics that people you know so be you know, it'd be good to just get an overview here. What is this technology? We heard a little bit about this tiny device that sucks DNA through and reads uh, one base pair at a time. But um, can you tell, Rebecca, you've sort of started with this. Can you tell us a little bit more uh, for, for, for people like Simon that want to, ha you know, discuss the ethics, but don't really know enough really about the technology? Yeah, of course, if we have to. I would say is that obviously 
the professor genomics is probably the best place to find out about these things uh, especially there were some talks uh, yesterday all about <laughs> is that the plug uh, plug yeah. sound yeah um, and you are those talks available to watch they later? are available on demand to watch now yeah. okay <laughs> fantastic um so yes the well I'll give a, my vague background um on sort of sequencing and why nanopore sequencing is a big deal to me but again if i'm if if i'm wrong you have to come you have to come and correct me otherwise yeah. whatever i say People is true watching on the vimeo we need your knowledge it's not just a question of being a um a spectator here we may well need your knowledge um if we've got something wrong we need you to to come in and correct us yeah. so the original mm. thing with how mm. sequencing so classic sequencing was done was that you can't just normally you can't just look at a single molecule you need a lot of it you need a lot of copies so therefore you can start figuring out mm. what is in a sequence mm. and it could it can then be read by a sequencer machine that can read either through um change um oligonucleotides or like through through fluorescence so you need something that's sensitive enough to be able to detect to do that, you need to make sure all your molecules are the same. To make sure they're the same, you have to uh, multiply them, which is why you probably heard this thing about sequencing called PCR, the polymerase chain reaction, which is the method for extending and multiplying a bit of DNA you want to sequence. And what you do is you stick um, something on one end that says, start, start building here. And then what, another one here saying, start building here. And you let them run. And then what happens is through a system of running along these tracks, if you like, separating and then more of these start and end joining because DNA is um, a paired system, you eventually get this uh, collection of molecules that are same size and the same sequence. And then <laughs> you could go through and start reading them. Now, what I said about the start and end that's okay when you know the sequence or you know a bit of the sequence somewhere nearby which is why now we can we can sequence things fairly easily and that is why the human genome Pro project took 10 years because you didn't know what you were starting and stopping you didn't know where you were where you were mapping things so that is why so if you can imagine these huge sequencing machines and all of this work and all of this intensity to get something you know maybe even like a killer base you know a thousand bases Whereas now we, you can have nanopore sequencing, you can just have a sing, one sample, a single sample, and just run it through, and mm. you get an answer. Uh, yeah. So um, thank you for that, Rebecca. Great summary. Um, so I mean, let's look at that the other way. And what, how is things going to work in the future? We've got this uh, DNA molecule uh, behind me. Uh, that's been magnified many, 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 many times. But I mean, you know, things are getting very, very small here. Um, and what, you know, okay, that's the history. We've gone from taking 10 years to sequence the genome to 60 minutes. Um, how are things going to pan out in the future? And as you say, Simon, what are the, what are the moral and ethical implications going to be when this technology is going to be available, um, you know, potentially uh in our phones or other phone size and shaped devices so people uh what do you think about this um what is it going to be used for do, does it make any sense um anyone want to come in on this one katie um i think uh, that the trend is that uh, considering how much the time needed has shrunk, I think it's reasonable to believe that sometime in the future, whether it's gonna be five years or 20 years or 50 years, we're gonna have a kind of instantaneous sequencing. Yeah. And uh, I think the cultural implications will be huge because if certain traits could signify likelihoods of certain abilities, who would, let's say, prevent uh, companies to use it to uh, even when hiring people it could be like another layer of information about you and uh, it, like now since it's costly and takes quite a while and uh, we know quite little about it how it relates to trade and so on 
uh, it's not as popular and not as uh, accurate. But as it progresses, I'm pretty sure that it will impact our daily life much more. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, we talked about. Did you mention there, Katie, like the idea of sequencing for a job interview? Is that what you said? You're a bit quiet there, so I couldn't quite hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, what do people think about that? Will, um, will we actually be, you know, submitting a, a, a you know, a, a, a swab with our CV or resume, as the Americans like to say? Um, and you know, how will that impact our, um, our employment chances? That's a, we've got also got a point here from Daniel who's watching on the Vimeo stream. Daniel, do come in, um, and, uh, expand on this point because you've said you also need the bioinformatics tools to interpret everything as well. So it's not just about, um, uh, reading that DNA and ever you're nodding it, there's a little bit more to the story so daniel do come and tell us what that is um uh ever you're nodding to i mean do you want to say a little bit more about that yeah i, I was going to say i think there's well there's definitely going to become a time where the data is cheaper and quicker and available to get but we're going to still have this real gap between the actually the knowledge and understanding so i think you know mm. i think we're at risk in, in the same way that i think it's I mean, I've probably gone on about this already before, but actually the, I think often the results you get from these like ancestry kits are often rubbish or at least um, aren't, they don't tell you anything meaning, like meaningful. Like most, mm. I think a lot of people might be 25% Viking or something. And you know, what mm. does that even mean? It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. So I think there's gonna be a point at which um, we, this will become cheaper. And then you know, people say, you know, have you got the, the genes to be a sports person or, um, you know, have you got the genes to do this and that? And I think it people will misunderstand how yeah. the how genes interact with everything else in our lives. So uh, environment, upbringing. So um, in a way that the the genes might get overinterpreted in a way. I think so. I think yeah. people will be looking to mm. make money off it. And and people and people like to be told a really simple story about science, and often it's a lot more complicated than that. It's not okay. just about having one gene. It's about having a collection of genes and then yeah. this kind of environment and something else on top so um that's my opinion anyway okay so um it's also about what the story being told is that's a really good point um daniel thanks very much for coming for coming on to the chat that's really great um do you want to say a little bit more about bioinformatics there may well be people on this chat that have never even heard of bioinformatics and so maybe you want to just say a little bit more about that um uh, why the bioinformatics are just as important as all these huge advances in sequencing technology. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's one thing that you, you get this uh, DNA sequenced, but what does it really mean? I mean, mm. uh, you can sequence your, your DNA and say, okay, you have, uh, and then do uh, you, some doctor tells you that you have a 50% more increase of chance getting breast cancer, for instance. How do, do they know this? So, I mean, if we talk about the bioinformatics, bioinformatics tools is, uh, let's say, date, uh, data pro, uh, programs that you're using to interpret the sequence that you actually have. And mm. these are supplied by many vendors uh, out in the market today that are having different tools and in, in interpret these sequences in different ways. And of course, if we talk about the future, it's quite interesting. Where is the ethical point of this? Uh, we were talking about submitting DNA, your DNA sequence, um, uh, uh, you know, with your resume or your CV. But how is your DNA sequence protected? I mean, we are talking about, you know, the ethics. Mm. I mean, if you are sequenced as a child, do you get any insurance from a company if you, they say that you have, are, let's say, 75% is a greater risk of having as a sort of cancer disease when you're turning 55. Are you getting that insurance then? Or is it just time dependent? Until you are 50, you are getting this insurance. After 50, we would cut you off because there is a greater chance. So it's quite interesting how, is one thing of sequencing your DNA, it's how mm. is that information used and interpreted as well? I mean. Uh, 
we've just had a, a comment in the chat from Simon saying, is it like Gattaca? But um, you think the Ga we're, Exactly we're, like Gattaca. I was thinking yeah. about that, actually. So, yeah. yes, Simon, you're correct. Yeah, so that is that could be the kind of nightmare view. But certainly in Gattaca, that, just as Evie was saying, that uh, those kind of genetic... Uh, uh, well, I suppose that, you know, the information was overinterpreted. It was, you know, and, you know, certainly when it comes to insurance, are we in danger of kind of like, you know, discriminating against people because of what, you know, some algorithm says is a chance within, you know, a chance of getting a disease within their, uh, within their genome. Um, any thoughts on this? Uh, Eva, you've got your hand up. Yeah, well, I think it, it's, it's interesting to think then, because if you think about it from an insurance point of view, genomic sequencing doesn't make, uh, well, it doesn't make much economic sense for maybe an, a state or a, a nation, for example, because um, you, as soon as you know that someone's got a predetermined disease, you, sort of, you don't want to insure that person, so they suddenly don't have any funding. But if you have some kind of uh, nationalized or guaranteed healthcare system, knowing you know, mm. information early on is can be preventative, and so economically for that state or for whatever whoever is funding that, that is suddenly a lot cheaper than uh, if you can start. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Any kind of therapy earlier than when you find out when you're fifty. So, um, so yeah, I think the the model. The, you know, there's. I don't know how you work out that economic model. Mm. So the economics on a huge macro countrywide scale actually makes sense, and having that information is really useful. But on an individual level, it, it isn't. And I think this is one of the things that's come up quite a lot in these chats over the last few days is that um, the picture looks very different, you know, for a lot. I, th I think obviously because we're going through this COVID time, a lot of people have been talking about the greater goods. Um, and, you know, that information is important for the greater good, but not necessarily it could be harmful for the individual. So how do we balance that? Um, you're nodding as well there, Jill. I don't know if you've got a point on that. Um, but yeah, where do we want to take this conversation? Where do we want to go? Do we want to talk about um, insurance or, you know, how this, how this information informs insurance decisions? Should we, um, should insurance companies be able to see this or is it information that can, that somehow, um, uh, should be anonymized. Uh, it's up. It's kind of up to you where you want to take it. Tamsin, you, you've not said much yet. Um, if you want to, if you've got any questions or any comments, you can always type them in the chat as well. Um, where do we want to take this conversation? It's up to you. Simon. No, yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, go on. Yeah, go on. I got that. Um, well, Mikey, I was just going to say, um, I, I kind of wonder whether there's a consensus among people that are working on the mapping of the, the genomes. Uh, as to what your kind of hierarchy of, of priorities is to do with that information. So I know that there's already, you know, been debate raised in this chat as to how it's interpreted and how accurately it's interpreted. I'd actually like to know from Daniel whether there is a de facto kind of right way of interpreting the data or if that's wildly um, debated. But also if let's say, for instance, we just magically have this correct sequence of, of the genome analyzed, what's the kind of hierarchy of what you do with that then? Are you trying to fix disease first are you trying to monetize it are you trying to i don't know i'd like to kind of hear from people as to what the ambitions might be for it daniel that's one for you i think okay no i i think how it's used uh, used today is uh, basically uh, to to understand how disease is uh, you know uh, are coming where it's coming from how we can monitor it and how we can fight it basically uh, the, this is how what they what, what they are doing, and that is also why this Hugo project, which uh, was mentioned by Rebecca, um, mm -hmm. was mentioned. I mean, why they did it to sequence the human genome so we can understand better and also monitor, especially within cancer and liquid biopsy, uh, you know, and, and make uh, since humans are so let's say fragile, <laughs> if you will. And uh, medi and uh, if you go to the doctor, you get uh, one medication. And of course, yeah, when you take it for a while, you can uh, create uh, some resistance to it. And that is why you need to submit your blood sample. They will sequence your blood to see if you have these resistant markers so they can change the drug. 
So in this way, this is a palliative or and preventive, let's say, maintenance of this sick person. So this is uh, one way of using it. Um, and of course, this is, um, so, so going back to Simon, I think this is uh, more like monitoring uh, and how, and also mapping actually. I mean, this is not only used for, for humans, it's actually used for, for species in general all over the world. I mean, we are talking about in environmental DNA as well. I mean, if you go into the environment, what species are present in a certain lake, they can track invasive species going in any way by sequencing um, uh, and so on. So it's just not only for humans, it's actually for, for the whole planet basically. So uh, it's quite an interesting topic. I mean, that, no one's, I think, yeah, I think it's definitely interesting, but I think, you know, um, the possibilities are huge compared to, um, you know, where we are now. I mean, what, uh, you know, as Simon said, what, you know, what is the starting point? What are the most important things to do? Or is it just kind of like up to people's imaginations to actually, Katie? Um, I, I just thought there might be one more area which uh, few people think about first when they think about sequencing, which is, uh, preserving endangered species. I mean, we know that uh, we're getting a quite significant climate change, which affects a lot of species, which may go extinct, extinct because of unsuitable climate for them. But what if we could preserve their genome accurately and later replicate it so mm. that once we fix the climate change issue, once we come back to, yeah. to the state where those species mm. can survive, we could integrate them back into our ecosystem and i think uh, kind of just like we do with seeds where we have a storage facility where we store a lot of seeds maybe we could have similar one for for our genome and it could be like you know we want to go to space to preserve humankind but maybe this could be yeah. a, a plan b so to say mm. okay so i mean to what extent can we kind of archive and reanimate extinct species or uh or reanimate ex uh in the individuals from the past if we've got their genome should we be storing uh genomes for that purpose uh, either other species or other other individuals um um is that a possibility for for the well, future individual, of individual isn't the dna i think it's it's nature and nurture so yeah like, so that wouldn't work so in, well. Uh, in, in China, I believe, there are people who clone their cats. And right. at least from the pictures I saw, the, the, the clone cats, even though the DNA is identical, they look absolutely different. Right. So, so uh, it's that's a phenotype thing <laughs> and yeah. an epigenetic thing. Yeah. Um, so you won't necessarily get the same cat back when you clone yeah, well, you won't get the so You yeah. won't get the same personality. Yeah, yeah, so I don't think it's for individuals or, or, or anything like that. But uh, but for preservation of species, I think it's I would yeah. vote for that. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I I believe it would be a great way to to use money or to use our okay. Resources. All right, so we're talking. We've moved away from the human genome. We're talking about other species. Is it a good way to preserve species? There's a there's a big problem of uh, uh, species diversity loss in the world. Is this is this any kind of uh, uh, help to to preserving species? Would it work? Um, could you create um, an individual uh, from a species from just having an archive of the Rebecca? You so you would need you need uh, genetic variation, mm. which is. Be, to be able to propagate a species that would remain fertile and, and so you need more than one yeah well you the... need you need lots more than one actually yeah like yeah. It, it's i don't i'm not sure how good we are at knowing this because it's mm. like all humans share like 99 point like we share 99.9 percent .9 of you know of our dna with uh chimpanzees but mm. we're very different um and also we're all very different to each other as well and it is like Katie said, it's all these nurture things as well. But those differences, having to having to try and save those and categorize mm. those in a way that would make it so that a species could propagate. Mm. I, I'm not sure we know enough 
on that. Mm. Uh, there's a point here from Daniel about Dolly the cloned sheep. So it is possible to um, to, to clone animals. Um, in that case, Daniel, um, it, there were other sheep around to kind to to uh, for that for you know. Uh, would it be possible to co to clone Dolly if we had no sheep left? If some somehow all the sheep, I don't think sheep are endangered species, but if they were, would it be possible to uh, to clone Dolly without having a, sh a sheep there already? It's uh, it's very hard to say. Uh, of course, if you if you have uh, stem cells that you can you know uh, program which we can uh, and you have the right genetic material uh, with a little bit of luck i guess it's possible but i think you need to have the right let's say um uh, tools uh, and uh, I, when it comes to stem cells they of course had the had these germline cells or the, the stem cells to put the genetic code from uh, Dolly into another sheep cell. So if uh, mm. they are in, in uh, let's say, endangered, then it's, uh, it's quite, uh, I think it's difficult, but they have spoken of uh, putting mam mammoth DNA into elephant yeah. uh, and combine mm. them to see if we can bring them forward. And they, for yeah. sure can. If it's ethical to do that, that's a different story. Then we are in mm. the ethical part again. Should we do it? That's a yeah. different story. Okay, so if we want to see mammoths, is it ethical to put a mammoth DNA into an elephant egg? Uh, Rahim, I think you had a point there. Uh, we can't hear you there, Rahim. If you want to just turn, uh, is your microphone turned on? Uh, Oh, we can't hear you. you. Maybe if you just write that in the chat or if you just have a little flick on the settings. We're talking about... Um... Hello? Can you oh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, there we go. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, we are talking about DNA and gene and all that. So my mind works slightly differently being an old person. Mm -hmm. How about uh, eradicating the old disease which human being gets is genetic... Uh, uh, you know, when they're born, they get some diseases and mm. we get rid of them by modifying the gene and DNA. A little bit yeah. tinkering and so so we, that. We were talking about this yesterday, and once again, it is a, I think it's a big, it's a big ethical question. Could you, um, could you actually modify the, the, the DNA of embryos if you detected, um, uh, if you detected the diseases within that genome, um, would it would it be a possibility, and would it be ethical to actually? Uh, Daniel, you're shaking your head, so you're pretty much against that. Can we? Can is it? Well, first of all, is it technically possible to edit uh, an embryo's DNA? First of all, and then is it ethically acceptable? The, there's two questions there, but I mean, maybe we will just deal with the first one first, either now or in the future. Is it technically possible to do that, to actually edit um, the DNA of a, of a child that, that, that may have a congenital disease? Daniel, you're, you're unmuting yourself there. Yes, it is. I mean, we have the technology today uh, to uh, yeah. alter the genome, to copy and paste into the DNA and go in and alter embryos and uh, make them express things. And this is, uh, th this is uh, doable uh, due to uh, CRISPR-Cas9, for instance, and gene mm. editing. So this is yeah. a technology on the market, uh, I mean, in the world today. So it is. Um, and I mean... And I, I, this is an, an ethical question and a moral question. Should you do it? I don't know. Um, uh, and of course, if, and I mean, there is some parents that again has, uh, you know, a hereditary disease. Then if the baby gets two of the genomes, uh, dominant genomes or recessive genomes from, um, from the parents, they can be really sick. So the parents actually screen themselves before they make, you know, get get babies. Um, 
so I mean um, that is a good thing uh, that you can do but of course to go in and alter in an embryo to mm. design your baby well then are, who are we to play God that is my question uh, yeah. basically okay is that playing God um, okay I just wanted to because I feel like there's a here this is a, the whole point of Talkie Okie is a very kind of democratic platform so it's kind of up to you where you want to take the conversation I feel like there's a group of people that want to go down the Jurassic Park route, and there's a group that want to go down some other kind of sci-fi dystopia about editing human beings. It's kind of up to you where you want to take this conversation. It's up to you. It's not up to me. Um, someone's renamed themselves. Yeah, I was going to say, I think that's Simon who's renamed himself God, which is yeah. Who are we very... to play God? But Simon's already decided to play God. So oh no, uh, apparently not him. Apparently not this not him. Simon. The other Simon. There's two Simons on the call. Oh, um, my apologies. Katie, okay. you have your hand up. Sorry. Um, okay, let me go to Katie. Diamonds, but only one God. Only one God. Okay, so Simon, you've renamed yourself God. That's all you're going to say. I'm kidding. Right I'm kidding. There are many gods. There are many gods. Sorry. Okay. All right. Um, anyway, we could get into a religious debate as well. We are, you know, it's we're totally free. We can talk about whatever we want. And people on the on the Vimeo as well, you, you're welcome to contribute Uh uh, wh where you want to take this, but I feel like the two main things here are about, are about the ethics of editing embryo DNA and the Jurassic Park thing, the possibilities and the ethics of that as well. So, Katie, where you want to, where do you want to take this? Um, I want to see if I can join both questions because okay. I think both of them uh, come down to ethics of it. Yeah, and uh, I think whether from r religious about God or uh, a atheistic perspective of, you know, nature, because many people who are atheistic just say, you know, it's not natural, whether putting God into the equation or not. And uh, so far, my, my comeback to that every time is that, uh, by definition, anything in the universe is part of nature. So mm. then we are part of nature and what we do is as well part of nature, whether we are editing DNA, whether we are creating AI or anything in between. In my opinion, since it is a result of evolution in the universe, where you start from stars and end up with consciousness, I think it's just the natural next step where we okay. have grown so, enough to the step where we can manipulate. So what, what you're mind. saying effectively, Katie, is I'm going to boil this down, is you're saying that editing DNA is part of nature as well. It's, I believe it's so. natural for human beings in 2021. So. Like, you, you know, animals, they don't change their environment, but we have developed tools and we are changing our environment. Mm. I mean, and yeah. we don't see any ethical implications of it, even though we are destroying a lot of other species in the world. A lot so, of people don't see any ethical implications mm. of that. Some so of it's them are religious, some are not. So mm. I, I think that all of it comes down to, to the fact that it's, as the species evolve, they uh, control their environment much more, yeah, and and, and themselves as well. So it's I mean, part we, of, it's part of our nature to control our environment, to use tools, to modify things, to modify nature, and and, and even ourselves. Like some people, mm. you know, they go to live in the mountains for two years before the running competition. Mm. In a way, they are also using certain like science understanding how human body works to manipulate it to reach certain yeah. results. So in my opinion, it's just a technologically higher level of the same. It's, it's, it's in our nature. I'm going to just put it like that. Um, okay. So that's Katie's point. So um, there's, that's a false dichotomy really between what is natural and what is uh, human because we are natural. Uh, Rebecca, you've got a point down there. Yeah, I just want to say that um, when on Katie's point of saying that people people don't think it's unethical when you you know when we when we like breed breed cattle breed livestock, mm. but then I would say there is a real big um, pushback against like genetically modified crops, for example. Yeah, even when it's not um, inserting genetic material, it's you know inserting foreign genetic material. I should say, even mm. when it is sort of speeding yeah. up a natural selection unnatural selection so i think it is it's one of these things where 
people are complicated and just because we say well people don't think this is unethical so this yeah. bit will be fine i think there's always going to be sides to these arguments and there's always going to be people who say no yeah. i don't want to um i don't the, uh, um you don't want to talk about that okay we're getting a round of applause there from dog uh our our uh, dyslexic deity um Okay, so where do we want to take this conversation? Do we want to talk about? Um, I, I, I would like this. I would like okay, to talk a little bit about the feasibility of Jurassic Park. Okay, yeah. Because who doesn't want to talk about the feasibility of Jurassic Park? Yeah. And unfortunately, from a science perspective, mm. I'm going to have to sort of break everyone's hearts. So the problem with um, the problem with DNA is that it is it is a molecule but it is not the most stable in the world. And the fact of the matter is, is that samples from the Jurassic period or any other like Cretaceous, et cetera, DNA isn't preserved right. enough in those, in, in those samples that yeah. we could then bring it forward. Not even in the amber of... Uh, not even in the amber, not even the blood of a uh, mosquito. Yeah, of a mosquito. Oh, dear, but yeah. what, what they have found was they have found uh, mm. blood vessels and sort of, the remains of blood cells which is mm. which is really exciting but just not quite as exciting mm. as yeah but DNA. I mean, okay, if, we, if we transpose the plot of jurassic park and make it i don't know paleolithic park and make it about mammoths because daniel mentioned the mammoths um is that I, I know it would be a mammoth project but um uh you know that's much more recent than the jurassic era what about that we're talking you know a few thousand years is it possible to re-enliven that some of that mammoth dna and stick it in an elephant that's going to you rebecca because you're the one who no, that's okay i was so i was sort of i was thinking of a different thing which is mm. there is a oh, i believe a canadian paleontologist who has taken a different stance have gone yeah. well Birds came from dinosaurs. Yeah. So aren't chickens dinosaurs? Right. So, and they have done this, is that if you assume or mm. uh, this thing of like genetic drift or like how much mm. genes change, yeah. you know, through time, those genes could still be there in chickens right. that make okay. them dinosaurs. It's just if they're turned on and off. So what I, you're talking about is re-evolving a chicken. Uh, so, into not a almost dinosaur. re-evolving, but sort of like re yeah. molding it. Because yeah. we're it's a similar thing that, you know, like I said, we share ninety-nine point nine percent of our DNA with chimpanzees. Yeah. But we're we 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 do not have um very dark colored hair mm. yeah. on our bodies. But it's the thing with if, with chickens, like I will find the paper, but he basically did make a chicken with teeth. Right. So that that is the way potentially we do Jurassic Park is yeah. by like sort of re-engineering chickens. Mm. But imagine that if you'd got a ticket to Jurassic Park and all that was there was like a tiny chicken with teeth, would you not be disappointed? I think the um, children would be. I mean, yeah. I am, but obviously yeah. I think it's hard to yeah. market. Okay, so uh, we've got a new face joining us, uh, Roisin. At the moment, we're talking about the possibilities and the ethics of something like Jurassic Park. Um, it may not be possible to extract the DNA from the blood within the mosquito, within the amber uh, of a Jurassic period bit of amber, but it might be possible to re-evolve a chicken to give it teeth. Um, and that could lead to a large, huge, you know, scary chicken. We've also talked about the possibilities of a, of a mammoth, of a, uh, what do you call it, a Paleolithic park, uh, where you've got mammoths running around. Um, but, and that's the technical side. I think we're more interested in, in a way than the ethical side, but there is an ethical side to this. That's where we are right now. Um, if anyone is watching on the, on the stream, please do put your comments in. Um, also, it'd be great to have a bit more science in this. Is it actually scientifically possible, whether it's ethical or not? Um, it's something that our panel can decide. Um, uh, and, uh, does anyone out there want to play God? Uh, that's what we're talking about right now. Uh, Raheem, you've got your hand up. Sorry, I have to come back again. 
Yeah. You know, I saw this more as an athletes, mm. and we are talking about Jurassic Park, yeah. which was created by Hollywood, mm. and we are trying to drop today. And ethics and morals, all religions have a very different approach. My question is, when DNA developed, when the universe came into being, and yeah. all the development, how this moral and ethics developed? If okay. you can understand those things, you yeah. will be. You can see one thing is important to me as a ex-scientist mm. and working in uh, all sort of laboratories and uh, producing pharmaceutical you know drugs and we are facing the COVID yeah. you know 19 and it's going to stay with us so the question is we can change DNA or something we can show this flu business disappeared from the earth okay so I'm going to I'm going to broaden that question out a little bit Rahim into like how can genomics actually um address the the covid situation um is it a bit like evolving a chicken with teeth in the sense that you could use some kind of genetic modification are there other ways in which genomics can actually um address the covid situation that we're in now um and that comes also you started off talking about ethics there's also a question in there at the beginning how did how did ethics evolve in human beings so it's up to you where you want to take this people on the talkie okay katie i i just want to add another question yeah if the um the using genomics is playing god then if we use genomics to survive this pandemic isn't it also playing god Maybe that's also an ethical from, let's say, other yeah, species' perspective, yeah. which is right, if we are gone. Okay, so if if genomics did help us overcome COVID-19, isn't that playing God as well? Um, Daniel, you want to come in here at this point? Yeah, um, well, that that's just the thing. Uh, even we are trying to play God when it comes to the covid we are still beaten. We can just yeah. prevent it from happening. Yeah, we're uh, playing and, God, but we're not doing very well at playing God. Well, we can yeah. we can try to find a vaccine, but if we were uh, that good at gene, you know, uh, altering our DNA to withstand the the flu viruses, I mean, we should have done this a long time ago. And this is, I mean, COVID is just one of the flu viruses that are circulating. You have influenza A, B, C, uh, who, whatever letter behind it. Mm -hmm. And this is just coming and they are changing every season basically. So, I mean, this is not going away. And even if we can modify our DNA to withstand the COVID, uh, mm -hmm. this sequence of COVID, we still now have the British version, we have the South African version, we have the old version, and we are for sure have many other versions coming. So, um, yeah, we can play God, but we will lose that battle, unfortunately, okay. especially against RNA viruses, since okay. they are mutations, so they mutate so frequently. But that's the good thing again. We can sequence and find the sequence, the, the unique sequence for that particular virus and try to fight it, but that's okay. it. So genomics helps us understand at least the sequence of a particular virus. We we can recognize it, I suppose, um, but we're not quite at the level of playing God. Um, if, if we were, it'd be a very poor God. It'd be one of the minor gods rather than the big players. Uh, Rebecca? Well, what I was going to say is that, uh, mm. moving from uh, Daniel's excellent point, is that yeah, we're not being very good at it and we can sequencing. But yeah, we should have done this a long time ago. It is just... Mm it's just a flu virus is that i think to say um playing god it, it does sometimes imply intent mm. and the fact of the matter is is that evolution and nature is far more i guess fickle than any god and that the reason why these viruses are so deadly is because they don't have an agenda yeah. apart from to live uh, to survive mm -hmm. and that's why these examples where suddenly you get a super virulent virus 
but you also don't get one that you usually don't get really super virulent and deadly viruses yeah. you you sometimes do but then mm. they burn out but, mm. and then that virus dies like smallpox mm. you know you whereas you if you think of how you think of smallpox compared to like the common cold you could say that one of them is much more successful than the other <laughs> yeah but to put intent um but yeah the the reason that genomics can help so much is because as very much again it was a flu vaccine because of so much of the previous work that was done on SARS has really helped for the research with pushing us forward to getting yeah. the vaccine as quickly as we can. So the fact not, that they're mRNA yeah. vaccines is so expe is so exciting, though. So it's not strictly speaking that we came to COVID without any knowledge. We'd already um, that the work had already been done on on some of those SARS viruses. Um, people that are watching out there, if you've got any more info on this, please do bring it in uh we're talking about playing god not that well we're talking about you know what does a virus want uh it just wants to replicate but well, it says rebecca um evie um, actually, I'm afraid this is going to be my final thought as well, but because um, I have to go. But I was interested in what um, Rebecca pointed out about the talking about, yes, you know, what, what does a virus um, you know, what is a successful virus, I guess, because mm. it was something that I think I had a few like family arguments with at like the beginning of the pandemic because um, I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know enough of the science, but I was, you know, I always was wondering, and like lots of people were saying, well, no, maybe we just need to. This is really early on in the pandemic. Maybe we need to all get it, and then we'll get herd immunity, or like the virus is going to uh, mutate, and then it's become less deadly. Um, but I, you know, I, my understanding of zoonotic diseases or viral diseases is like, yes, but how do we know it's going to become? How do we know that it's become less weak for us? Maybe it will breathe through humans but then it will live successfully on cows or something so mm. um i i i don't know sometimes i it made me think oh i wonder whether we we know enough about viruses because i felt like there's quite a lot of armchair twitter science going on yeah. where people said that they would just oh we'll be fine mm. with the together and we'll get weaker when yeah. it might not become weaker for us for example yeah. so there's a lot of but armchair experts out there when it comes to covid and certainly uh if you just scroll through facebook you'll see a lot of opinions about uh, all sorts of things, viruses, even genomics. And in a way, this puts someone like me in a difficult position because my job really is to try and widen this discussion and bring people in. But at the same time, you know, we're talking about things that people don't necessarily have the knowledge about. They've read something about it. Um, so how do you actually get that debate going? And um, when, But there's all these ideas that are out there that may or may not be true. Um, uh, you've got a from dog, so dog agrees with that. Um, uh, luckily, uh, I, I don't think dogs are that susceptible to COVID. So, um, uh, but where do we want to take this? Uh, is that you saying goodbye, Evie? Well, thank you. I'll just give you a round of applause. Yeah, thank you so much. It point. was really interesting to meet you all. Um, thank you guys. And there's also another point about the chat, and I wonder um, the chats. And this probably goes to those, you know, those people in the field, the chats that you have with friends and relatives about the science. Is it difficult? Could it be made easier? Do people understand enough about the science of, of uh, Daniel's kind of shaking his head about of, of COVID? And how do we bring in a wider audience to actually, you know, debate some of these things? Um, that's a really good sort of f final point from Evie. Anyone got any experience of chatting with their friends and family about some of these issues? Rebecca? Yes, um, so um, mm. I'm one of a couple of scientists in my friend group, but mm. uh, one who did more uh, background in genetics. Mm. And it's been interesting to try and talk to people in a way that, <sighs> What I will say with the conversations I've had is I'm, I'm not dealing with people who are like diametrically opposed. Mm. And I think that is where the really difficult uh, conversations happen, especially when it's like close family. Mm. I, I, I always find interesting these sort of debates where people go, well, you know, they're wrong because of X, Y and Z or don't listen to the evidence or the, or the ethics. And I always have to mm. go, yeah, but which I agree with. But there is that difficulty when it is someone really close to you. Yeah, you know, and you're trying to explain, and you're trying to 
get it across. Like I had the, I had the joy of just trying to explain to someone why the vaccine mm. would take so long. You know, it's like, oh, why they're saying these things like this, the Pfizer one has to be sorted at minus 70 and this is minus 20. It's like, you know, and they're like, I don't care. You know, I just want the vaccine. Yeah. Um, which is fair. And I was trying to explain that, oh, it's minus 70 because mRNA is a lot more unstable. Mm. And then tr then you try and go down the yeah. line of explaining the science as much as people want to listen. I think there is al always the fear of just talking at people yeah. when they don't. They just want to know if they're going to be OK or if their family is going to be OK, yeah. especially at this sort of time. OK, so, you know, it can be very, very complex. You have to start talking about mRNA and then you have to explain quite a lot just to make a, you know, a very small point about, uh, in your case, vaccine storage. Danny, have you got a view on this? Uh, uh, how have you, uh, how have you found trying to explain some of these things? We're in a particular, you know, in a unique time, really. But how have you had that issue of trying to explain the science behind it? Was suddenly people are interested because it affects them in such a much more uh, direct and immediate way? um not particularly i would say i mean yeah. this vex if you talk about the vex vaccine and how that was developed and they are what rebecca pointed out why is taking so long uh, and so on the, the hard part i think is to to really uh, get them to understand that it takes time for a vaccine to get into the market to actually be tried on humans it takes a l many years normally mm. so and that is what we uh, also saw with the first uh, sars uh, kind of for the swine flu when uh, we all get the vaccine very fast and then we saw the side effects with narcolepsy especially here in sweden i don't know if you got it mm. but there was a lot of because it was you know, the side effects was not known. And I, I know also we saw a, a lot of, uh, let's say, information here in Sweden when you guys started in the UK that the side effects were, it's quite, there are many side effects of the vaccine. And this is also because it's, you know, um, it's kind of pushed forward yeah, because there is a, a need for it. And it also comes a cost. And then again, we're talking about, um, and then, uh, you know, you have, should I take the vaccine or should I not take, take the vaccine? Because it is, a, it's, it's a little bit of gambling, especially if you are like we are, some of us in science, we know uh, that if, a, you know, a vaccine comes forward this quick, mm, you're starting to doubt. And yeah. this is the thing. Yeah. And this is where you, um, and especially in, in my position where I need to travel a lot, sometimes I, I know that well, should I gamble uh, or should I just take the vaccine and uh, hope for the best that I don't get a side effect? And uh, and for, for what I know, I already had, had COVID, so I don't know, mm. do I really need the vaccine? That is also something. Should the ones that had COVID mm. already get vaccinated? That's also a question you should yeah. ask. Because um, yeah, I mean, I guess, it, uh, do people non-scientists appreciate that kind of the uncertainty that's in science it's is a conversation we had on day one actually um in this series of conversations um science is all about discussion and uncertainty when public health is about a very definite message this is what we are going to do we're going to lock down we're going to take a vaccine we're going to implement this strategy where all the scientists are, are you know busy kind of debating the finer points of it and and in a way it's a kind of you know you there's, there's two different messages there which are kind of go against each other um katie you've got your hand up uh, thank you well i had a few conversations uh, about both actually the dna editing and the vaccine because I, I just love these topics Especially the more controversial the topic, the more in love I fall with it. And uh, what I have found is that, uh, at least in my circle, a lot of people want to know, but they don't want to spend time to understand. Mm. So, as long as science can give a very rigid answer, they'll be very happy. But once science 
you know, you reach the the front line of science where it's going, usually it's very uncertain. I mean, when Einstein wrote his the theory of relativity, it wasn't certain until but a few decades later. So, mm. so people usually have trouble with that because they say, you know, I need to know because I need to make decisions today. Mm. And uh, it's one of the reasons many people don't gamble. And here, you know, taking vaccine and not taking vaccine both are gambles in this case. Yeah, so it's a, so it's a gamble. So, so to make a better decision, understanding is required. And I think this is one of the probably lessons that a lot of people are learning at the moment, that you need to spend time to dig in. You need to spend time to understand. Otherwise, you will struggle to make the right decision. Mm. Well, I guess people have got a lot of time on their hands, by and large, at the moment. Uh, if you're not um, uh, you know, a medical professional, People do have time in their hands to try and understand these things. Is the understanding growing? And is, in, is that in the end beneficial for fields like genomics? Uh, where, you know, I have to say, I've, this is year five for us uh, doing Tokyoki at the Festival of Genomics. And um, yep, we'll have a. Um, but, you know, that. It, there's, there's so much excitement and, you know, for want of a better word, hype in, within the field. But when you talk to people outside, um, you know, it's our job to kind of bridge that gap to that wider audience. It's really very little understanding. But is this just a chance to actually increase the understanding of some of these fields? Simon, I think you had a point down there, Simon, did you? Simon O? Or, uh, I... Yep, sorry. Or yeah, do you have a point, Simon C? Uh, uh, do you do you want to go down the um, postmodernist head funk? That was funk, F-U-N-K. Um, sort of like cul-de-sac, uh, and get more complicated. Or do you want to? Is that okay? Well, it's kind of up to you. This is Tokyo. It's up to you. What, what, where do you want to take this conversation? All right. So, so there's the thing. I'm just getting my head around it. I don't fully understand it yet, but it's metamodernism. We've lost it's you. the thing that comes after postmodernism, mm. and I think um, I was thinking about when you were saying, he was saying, "Can you hear me?" I finally left you, friends. We spent uh, so much time getting people to deconstruct things, and now people are deconstructing things, and the grand narratives are collapsing, and people are like, "Oh yeah, the media lies and stuff like that." Now, ironically, it's a time that uh, it's like, "Oh, we actually want people to do kind of like the same thing and to actually follow." An official message but now we've got the genies out of the bottle and people know that governments lie that the media has an agenda they know that for example if they're, if they're savvy they know that science works in paradigms as well and like maybe they remember things like the thalidomide um and stuff like that and i'm not i'm not giving a view on the vaccine one way or another by the way um it's just we there's there's an increasingly complexity in the world and yet at the same time there seems to be a backlash against that and people want to, if you follow that trajectory, then I, I break everything down and I go, right, I'm just one of like zillions of subjective realities. How am I going to construct my reality? I'm not going to buy into the old stories of queen and country and trust the government and stuff like that. I'm going to have to construct my own world. That's going to reflect my personal prejudices. So some of those prejudices that people are using to rebuild their own worlds now that the grand narratives have collapsed are not necessarily useful or positive. And if you want to be, um, I'll just finish it by saying, if you want to be, um, if, you, if you were sort of like thinking a bit dystopianly or, or not positively, you might think that we are just going to fragment and fragment and fragment mm. until we're a truly atomized society in our own little worlds. Okay, so you're basically, I'm one going to do some sum up uh, that you're getting actually a round of applause from the other Simon. Uh, I'm going to sum that up as, you know, um, we've, we've learned to become distrustful of the large institutions. And now there's a point where we, we need to trust these large institutions um, when, we, when we've got a global crisis on our hands. Um, but we're building our own realities. And sometimes those realities can't possibly have the level of expertise that whole government or, you know, that, um, that a more kind of, let's say, organized 
view of the world can have or a universal view of the world. So, you know, we, we miss out on this, these very kind of deep scientific understandings. Uh, Simon, you were applauding, so you're kind of agreeing with that. That's the other Simon, Simon Owen, you wanted to say something. But uh, there's a few people that have not said that much yet. Jill, Roisin, um, do come in on this point. Um, Simon, did you want to say anything there? I mean, yeah, I'm kind of, I, I really appreciate what uh, other Simon said, a bit of Simon mm. nepotism going on, but um, yeah. it, it genuinely, uh, it resonates with me quite highly. I think that in my experience, I've, I've known a surprising amount of people who are very dubious about either the existence of COVID or the effective responses to it, the vaccine, all kinds of stuff. And there's definitely a link between the kind of conspiratorial nature of the thinking and the experience that people have had of governmental bodies beforehand and their perception of the actions of governmental bodies and I, and I think that um I should say that I, you know it was really nice to hear from Daniel about the complexity of the scientific uh, opinion on vaccines and that that but communicating that um level of uncertainty and and conflicting narratives will just serve to make people incredibly insecure about the whole process and so it's almost like the world health organization the global you know the the, the public face of health has to prescribe that this is absolutely fine whereas that flies in the face of what some scientists say there's an incredible level of complexity there and what you've got mm. is essentially a breakdown of trust between some you know participants in uh in society and official mm. kind of spokespeople for uh you know for their well-being um and and basically that kind of postmodernist critique that simon was talking about i think is a really prevalent thing and i don't want to mention the b word but it's my last thing you know the brexit you've got when you've got gove saying you know i think we've had enough of the experts it's like well holy shit the chickens have come on to roost four or five years later and it looks like yeah. we really do need the experts and yet faith has been eroded in that uh, by this yeah. kind of liquid modernity or whatever you want to call it Okay, so there's a kind of anti-expert culture that's happening right now. Um, and how, you know, is it kind of, in a way, is it effectively dangerous to actually convey this scientific complexity to a public that is already cynical and paranoid? Um, so, uh, Rebecca, I think you wanted to chime in here. Yeah, so I think probably because I, I, I am more science based and I'm more science minded mm. that whenever you hear stuff that says, you know, don't trust the experts, you go, that has never worked ever. <laughs> in, in a way why, that why, is. Why do people say don't trust the experts? What's I that think it's about? because yeah. I think it there is obviously a, a disconnect in <sighs> people don't like being talked down to, people don't like being things hidden from them and potentially this is you know science does have a a, a communication mm. issue sometimes mm. uh although i'm sure daniel will correct me <laughs> just one thing i would say about um the way it's been handled and that potentially being a metamodern thing what i would say is that this current situation has been handled very differently in lots of different places and there are some countries that have done a lot better mm. that are and you can yeah. say oh they're not as big enough they're not as populous but i still think that there is something in that in looking at other people and how they acted and not doing it not looking for excuses but looking for lessons and looking for stuff we can learn and apply because that's what we all need to do mm. okay so let's look at other countries and is it a cultural thing is it a political thing is it a bit of both um, these are some questions. I saw Jill um, kind of raising an eyebrow at that. Have you got a, an opinion about all of this? Is it right to actually um, involve a public in a, a complex and sometimes, you know, um, multifaceted debate when you've got a very clear public health message that could save lives? And th this is what really what we're talking about right now. Uh, Daniel, you've got your hand up as well. Um, yeah, so I, I, you, you, you stated very well, if the public health has a clear message, but the problem here is they don't. Mm. And especially in Sweden, you see experts fighting each other in media, in the, in, in the newspaper and everywhere. They are arguing what is the best approach uh, of doing this and that, and they are arguing about the vaccine. So, of course, if you go back to my mother, which has worked in a factory all her life, doesn't know anything about science, looking at the news like she normally do, and all, all of a sudden she goes, turned to me like, um, so what should I do? Should I take the vaccine or not? 
Um, and I mean, this is, this is coming back a little bit to uh, politics again and unity, and they are not unified. And also in Europe, if you look at about Europe, I, I mean, uh, how uh, the different countries has uh, closed down and how the different countries have managed the, the COVID situation and also how they have treated the neighbor. Um, and I mean, uh, hey, hello, I'm from Sweden. We were the bad guys uh, throughout the whole spring. Everyone, the whole world looked at Sweden and say, wow, Sweden is the bad guys. We are handling the situation very, very bad. And well, we, we have a severe situation in Sweden still. And of course, the rest of the world still has a severe situation. So there is no difference, mm, yeah. even if we have a little bit, let's say we're a little bit more open. But again, it was a fight among the experts coming back to what the, the unified message. Um, and I think this is this is um, where, and going back to WHO, uh, uh, and they're so yeah. not even they are unified in the message that they are sending. So it's it's hard for the normal, yeah, you know, average Joe to follow. I mean, when it comes to your mum, have you managed to convey? that kind of sense of a debate and uh, I've, that, you know, in terms of like the understanding and where we are. And to me, I think it's especially about the uncertainty. If you manage to sort of convey that, that, that it is some of these things are just unknown and we have to wait and see. It's, there is a personal problem here for me uh, mm. since I don't know if I should take the vaccine and my mother, which is, Mm. She is in the risk group. She's really, yeah. she had underlying disease and so on. Mm. So if she gets COVID, she is going to be really, really bad. I think she may mm. not even survive COVID if she gets it. However, the side effects that she might get from the vaccine could potentially mm. also, you know, do her harm. Yeah. But then we are back to, okay, if she gets COVID, she will die. If she gets the vaccine, she may get some side effect, but yeah. she live. So I guess mm. I want her to be alive. So the vaccine is yeah. the option. Yeah, I, I understand the logic. Jill, did you want to chime in there? Um... Yeah, I, I, I think there is a lot of debate and there's a lot of uncertainty. But I think there is one certainty that the vaccine protects you against COVID. So yeah. I'm in the risk age group and I'm just waiting for my vaccination to come because mm. I, want, I want to be safe. I'll take the risk of getting a few side Effects. So, so are, are you worried to, about side effects and risks? Uh, it is a possibility, but I think the risk of not use, taking the vaccine is greater than the risk right. of the side effect. That's that's my point. <laughs> and are, are you worried about the efficacy of the vaccine? Or are you confident? No, I, uh, think, I think I think it's you could be worried about the efficacy, but if you don't take it, you won't get any protection. Okay, so it's. So, it's the best you've got, basically. It's, pardon? It's the best. It's, it's your, your best possible option, really. Yeah, it's the best option yeah. at the moment. Yeah. Mm. And what, I mean, what do you think about this kind of, the, the, in terms of how messaging is done or how, because, you know, is there a conflict between science communication, which communicates all the different possibilities, um, and the public health message? Do you think that, that those things can be at odds with each other? Um, I don't know. I think in, in science, you've always got a whole lot of different um, um, opinions and then you've just got to ba balance it up and see what is for the greater good. I think that's, that's what it is. And, and we are getting quite strong public health messages about mm. the, the usual things. Yeah. And I think that those are simple and they can't do anybody any harm. So why not go with it? That's okay. Fine. Uh, because as a raised hand from Katie. Thank you. Um, I think that uh, again, I will bring that. I don't know. I'm, I'm becoming kind of a fan of that Thomas Professor Avi Loeb, who also points out that if, if, you know everyone in society, considering that we we try, we want to have a democracy, right? Mm as far as possible but for a good democracy the population has to be educated so they must understand what science is and uh, any at any point in history if we look back what science said about anything on any topic whether it's 
diet or physical health or any other thing. Every time it's just the best explanation we've got at the time. Um, you you know, uh, many people say, oh, you know, science changes all the time. But I think that's a good thing. We're getting more and more accurate. But it, it, it's like, you know, we're approaching the, the end of the monolith stage, but we never get there, so to speak. And many people find that hard to accept. And uh, I think in a large way, it, it has to do with the way we have been educated. Because at least I come from Lithuania. I don't know how education is in other countries. I believe it's much better. But there, a lot of, uh, like, most pronounced part is memorizing things. So people assume that, okay, I memorized this so I know. Yeah. But uh, they, they don't understand that you need to understand the subject. You need to understand the concept mm. to be able to know that it's not a 100% accurate description. Just like, you know, children in school, first they learn that planets go around the sun, then they learn that, you know, it's, it's actually about the common gravity point. So, and yeah. also it's not exactly in circles, it's in ellipses, but also not exactly in ellipses. So all these mm. things, you can get more and more and more accurate, and it doesn't mean that the previous description was wrong per se. It's just that how accurate do you need to have enough information to make your decision? Okay, so... Um... Science is an ever-evolving field. Is education, the way education happens, uh, certainly in Lithuania, which is about memorizing a certain amount of facts, but not necessarily analyzing those facts or um, having those facts as a kind of dynamic thing that keeps updating and refining. Um, that th this is really important. Is our society, you know, actually equipped to embrace this more dynamic sense of knowledge? And um, there's a point, I think, from Don, uh, who's watching on the stream, uh, which is a really good point. Um, is, it, is, it time, um, is it time to revisit, uh, is ethnography, sorry, worth a revisit as a science? Learning what not to do, ethics and calamity, such as doing good eugenics from the last century. So, do, I mean, are we really sort of like understanding the... Uh, in a way, some of the calamities of science, uh, things like eugenics, where things have gone wrong. As much as cultural values induce a throttle on basic research and science. Okay, well, there's a, there's, there's a few points there, Don. Come and jump on uh, the Zoom. We want to hear a bit more about it. I'm probably like messed that one up a little bit, uh, but it's there for other people to read in the chat. Um, come and explain that a bit more. Daniel came on from watching it on the stream and he's bossed this Talkie uh, Oki has been a really important, um, really important contributor to this discussion. But where are we going to go with this discussion? Is it about a question of like how we really our relationship to knowledge? Simon, you've got a, a hand up. Yeah, it, basically, it's almost like a conjunction of the last two points that I made. I think what Katie mm. said was very, um, very accurate and very, uh, very interesting. We we need a foundational understanding of things. I came on this call knowing that. Actually, I'm fascinated to hear stuff, but I'm by no means a genomic expert whatsoever, and I'm learning mm. okay, I'm on the fly. And I know how much I don't know and how much I need to know in order to even express a rudimentary opinion on it. However, the weakness of that, as exemplified by Don in his comment, is essentially it wasn't necessarily the the acknowledgement that we didn't our science in the late 1900s that led to eugenics was it was there was no recognition it was incomplete it was the application of the science not the science itself it wasn't the, the redundancies in the science it was the fact that in retrospect you can see that the application of that science led in some people's minds towards the holocaust movement which was you know yeah. and, and some people would say it was the inevitable outcome of that focus of a scientific basis of eugenics and i think tying that back into genomics and, and reading the the gene sequencing and stuff like that ultimately in conjunction with our conversation on COVID, if we said, okay, we can edit everybody's genes in some fantasy world, we can edit everybody's genes to remove susceptibility to COVID, you will no longer, no one will ever suffer from COVID, no need for a jab, no need for a cure. Universally, I'm sure people, well, practically universally, people would accept that. But then you can do, you know, genetic genome editing for, say, Huntington's disease or, or you know, cystic fibrosis, stuff like that. You know, you start to kind of move up a scale of, of where you set your bar for what is acceptable ethically to, to change and to edit. And eventually you could facilitate Katie's argument better by then editing for intelligence, academic intelligence, the, the, the nous and the prowess and the natural ability to be able to absorb all this information and to be able to process it better and more analytically. But that's a very slippery slope to go down because 
so I wonder, uh, essentially, I guess one of the things I'm asking is, is where do everybody is a, a kind of an amateur eugenicist in their head, but where do you set this bar <laughs> so that it's a safe yeah. thing to experiment with, mm. not, a, not mm. a morally problematic one? Um, I, I don't know if everyone would uh, kind of, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I don't want to judge or not judge, but would everyone say they're an amateur eugenicist in their heads? Um, uh, thesis, Mikey, but yeah. what I'd say is that the, yeah. the, everybody, I think if you push them on it, everybody could think of something that they'd like to eradicate from the human experience. And if you could do that via genes, then essentially I'm fudging definitions mm. a little bit. Yeah. Like you're kind of getting into eugenic yeah. thinking, right? Okay, so is it eugenics to want to eliminate anything from the human genome? Um, Rebecca's got a, like a ha head in her hands. I don't know if... Uh, it's, it's, because, it's because you're not particularly wrong, you know. Mm. I think it is that you're right that everyone sort of has a line and the problem is is how you go about it and how you regulate it and how you communicate it I think which I know is a bit of a cop-out answer mm. but what I'll say is something like for example when we a lot of us heard about the CRISPR edited uh, twin baby girls in China yeah and w what my sort of <laughs> it was interesting because it did br it bring up this, it brought up this debate a lot where people were like shocked because it wasn't legal it's still not legal to do mm. and arguably that has pushed the date of that ever becoming legal you know way off into the future now because it was done wrongly because it wasn't done with permission and because it wasn't done well mm is another thing because science isn't perfect and procedures aren't perfect but with something like that if it's going to be that bigger thing that's going to cause so much tension which obviously it is it's, it's yeah. gene editing embryos that then were born the fact that it wasn't the fact that these twin girls aren't even <laughs> aren't even immune to hiv yeah and also the fact that they are they've got different deletions in the C delta five or CC five gene. I think it does even more harm because, and the fact is, like, well, why? Why did you need to give the protection against HIV? Mm. That's not a big issue. If it had been, oh, these girls would have never survived. It still would have been wrong because I do think you need that regulation and that legality there. But I think it has just made us all, made it all happen, like pushed it away from us even more. Yeah. So you, in a way, that's kind of, yeah, that's put the, this idea of editing human genome further into the future or, or, or kind of like chucking it out of the, the realms of feasibility because it was done in such a, you know, I'm going to say, poor way. Is everyone familiar with this story of, the, of, the, of these twins that, okay, maybe you need to... Rebecca can just very quickly just give a, a one sentence or two sentence kind yeah. of explanation. So um, the idea with these uh, twin girls is that they were embryos made from uh, IVF, so in vitro fertilization, where you had the eggs from the mother and you put in the sperm and then fertilization happens. And then those embryos were sequenced and then a method called CRISPR was used to I believe yeah make deletions in a particular gene that is a, a gene that codes for a protein that people who don't have this particular expressing protein are more resistant slash more resistant I'm going to say to HIV so right. the idea was if they didn't have this gene they couldn't get HIV now the thing about that is that HIV is a very what I'm saying is that HIV isn't transmissible through sperm <laughs> through through that method. Like there, right. there 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 is a problem of like uh, mothers who are HIV positive passing it on to their uh, babies in the womb, but in this case it was the father that was HIV positive. Yeah. Um, so but yeah, that that that, yeah. that was the briefing. They were trying to get rid of deletions so they'd never get HIV, but the 
with current education and stuff, the chances of that yeah. are very low. So there was luckily. a low risk of them getting HIV and they're not particularly immune from HIV either. And you're messing around and potentially uh, bringing in other things that are now in their germline through that process. Yeah, and, and I think as mm. we mentioned the other day, the issue, mm. one of the main things that ed doing gene editing is that it goes, is that it's not just that person you are then passing that on through who knows how many generations your, children, your children's children forever okay uh katie you've got your hand raised um just to, uh come back to rebecca's point um, this story of these two uh, twins essentially uh it did scare a lot of people but uh I, I was one of the people who actually got very excited because for about a decade, I was surprised no one did it earlier. That was my only question. Why didn't we do it before? Why we're not throwing all of our resources into this? Because it's so, you know, you can do so many great things with it. And, mm. uh, and I think this kind of a cultural stigma about any new thing that comes across, that, that our civilization comes across, we first reject it. Then we figure out how we need it, and then we only begin learning how to use it. And uh, it's kind of initial backlash to, to most things new and that people don't understand fully. And uh, I do want to bring the, our dog, Simon's point, that uh, uh, imagine you get rid of anxiety, but it turns out it was a part of creativity or the richness of human experience. And uh, I think it is a very great point because we don't know the outcome. But I don't think without the research we can ever find out the outcome. Right. So, so mm. again, I, I think, uh, I, I don't believe that uh, humanity ever come, can unify in their yeah. ideas, opinions about any subject whatsoever. There, there are just way too many of us. Someone will have a different one. So, right. so, so then comes my question, how, is it possible in any way that, uh, you know, if, if we follow the ethics, uh, the hard ethics of, you know, any kind of intervention is bad, is one kind of extreme where other parts gets people who want to do it, who want to be part of it, they get left out and they're put to the fringe, which doesn't stop the science, just makes it less visible and uh, less accurate, I believe. Or or is it better to just do more research so we don't so we make less mistakes mm. uh, I, I think it's in a way i can bring even uh, rocket science into this you know how in uh, in 60s and 70s we were building rockets and we would spend a decade to build just one and doing our best that it's safe we still had rockets explode and now spaces is just exploding a rocket every month or two mm. uh, because they want to test as much as possible and do it the, the best possible way so I, I think in this area, it's also very similar. We can do as much as possible so we figure out quickly, or we yeah. can drag it out in the fringes and... Uh, okay, so you... So, what, what is the way out? I'm just going to sum I'm gonna sum this up, uh, this point, Katie, and just say, um, if you are doing these experiments, you are learning the question from Simon, if you discover that anxiety has is part of the part of creativity for example at least you find out if you do the experiment um but i guess the other side is yeah. that that's human beings that you are experimenting on uh roisin you had a point but like human uh, beings already are born with many different uh mm. like traits right yeah. some some don't have anxiety there are some people who don't experience pain at all and, yeah. and, and they find it hard to smile because of that so we know that pain is necessary even though maybe the years yeah. ago would have loved to eradicate it. Absolutely, absolutely. It's a very good point. I, I, if, if I'm not mistaken, there was some research on addiction where they disabled a part of the brain uh, so that people wouldn't be addicted and they lost the will to live. So, so suddenly we found out that that is also important. Yes. But, but that's the thing. Research gave those answers. Yes. I, mean, I think I think we got that. We got the point. We got the point. Uh, let's uh, move to Roisin. Uh, yeah, I was going to say regarding the gene editing, the kind of stigma and things that I don't like about it would be that once you can kind of pay to be perfect, 
well, anyone that can't afford to have the perfect children, would those children be blamed for their faults? Like everything would suddenly become a choice rather than just the way you were born. Like your yeah. race would be a choice, your gender would be a choice, your height would be, would be a choice. And just the rich people would have these perfect children and they just get further away from everybody else. And I don't know what that would mean to society. Yeah. Would it lead to a kind of divergence in the human race? And we've already, we talked, we've been talking for days about uh, disparity of access, health inequalities, um, all of these things. Would editing human genomes actually lead to a kind of even greater disparity amongst people um, and lead to perfect uh or more perfect uh children uh, there's a point from b uh from dog do you want to just come on and say it rather than me having to read it out <laughs> no, I, I want you to do it mikey please okay all right so dog says guys trust me being perfect this is the form of god as well trust me being perfect isn't all that i still have bad days Um, okay, so uh, where are we going to go with this conversation? Uh, do we want to talk about, you know, Katie's point that sometimes we fight, we act well, most of the time, that's really what science is all about, is learning from experiment. Um, someone's got to do it, and we can shitty shally around ethics this, ethic, ethics that, uh, you know, human germlines, but we've got to find these things out. You also pointed out that we found a lot of these things out just from the natural variation, such as people with an inability to feel pain. Um, so yeah, so yeah, there's there's a couple of things there. Um, where do we want to go with this conversation? Uh, we're running into the final stretch. Um, any Rebecca? Uh, only because I feel as as parts. As we are at the festival of genomics, mm. um, I feel I should say try and bring it back to potentially mm. maybe a broader interpretation of the future of sequencing is that perhaps mm. now sequencing, the future of sequencing will be at the moment you go to your doctor and potentially you can get uh, whole genome sequencing and potentially mm. see a risk. We've mentioned that about uh, 23andMe and Ancestry, but the future might be, I assume, will be that it will become a lot more normal and a lot more commonplace will do so but then at what point does it stop is it say oh okay we think you've got you know at the moment it's like you've got a more above average risk of developing uh, type 2 diabetes mm. but will it then go to oh your child okay yeah about 50 percent chance maybe uh, will suffer with anxiety for say or 50 percent chance is going to be more creative yeah or potentially your child could grow up to become an artist Exactly. Um, and then obviously with yeah. the way the technology is going yeah. with like the, the Minion from Nanopore, this tiny machine, Yeah. you know, what happens when it's like, oh, we go from at the moment just our, our DNA, but what if we then go to seeing, you know, the epigenetics and mm. how our genes are being expressed, would it be yeah. like unlocking your phone being like, oh, I wonder how my, I wonder what my stress gene is doing today, which is a yeah. slightly facetious, but yeah maybe that's what it could go to. Could it lead to that kind of, you know, that kind of self-examination that social media and the, certainly the big data from social media is is kind of encouraging us to examine all kinds of aspects of ourselves? Would it lead to a kind of self-obsession if we knew so much about our genes? Uh, we've got a new face here. I'll just say, we, you know, we started off talking about the future of sequencing. Then we talked a little bit about... Um, Jurassic Park, is it a reality? And what are the ethics of Jurassic Park? Or um, uh, what, what was it called? Paleolithic Park, where you've got mammoths instead of Tyrannosaurus Rex running around. Chicken Park. And then with the Chicken Park, where you've, um, it's a bit more, it's not quite as exciting, but you've got a chicken with teeth running around, uh, exhibiting its dinosaur, uh, its archaic dinosaur, uh, phenotypes hidden there. Um, so that's what we were talking about then when we we're talking more widely about the understanding of science when it comes to COVID. Is that public discussion of science actually at odds with the public health message? And how can you communicate the uncertainty or the lack of uh, understanding of people that know a lot about science, but they don't really know the answers they're trying to find out when it comes to things like the vaccine? And how do you communicate 
that to people that are at risk and real lives are at risk. Those we, we talked about that. Then we talked about uh, would it be worthwhile or right to actually to edit people's genes to uh, give them a resistance to COVID or other diseases? And now we're talking about uh, the same old designer babies and what is the future of sequencing going to be when we read our our epigenetics, what our genes are switched on and what genes are switched off, um, that comes onto our phones as part of an, of an app in the future when Nanopore uh, just becomes an app on our phone. Simon, you've got a point there. Uh, no, not a point, a question actually. Question, um, yeah. So for this more scientifically uh, able in the, uh, in the group, it seems yeah. like they constitute many, many more than me. Um, I guess circling back to one of the things I was looking at at the beginning, like how how close are we to the example that you gave, Rebecca? I don't know whether that was kind of facetious and over the top, but in terms of understanding specific relationships between specific genes or, or, or DNA patterns oh. and, pairs and stuff like that, and the actual effects they have, because the analogy I was uh, mm. always told, I think this was relatively recently, with somebody talking saying it's like trying to point at a city and say where's the economy you know it's like it's 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 everywhere and it's inextricably linked and we don't yet know how that works and so um is there a kind of time frame or is that something that we is still well beyond our reach to figure out what affects what in a way i i would sort of like to hear uh, daniel's uh sort of view on this being more uh, in the industry than me because yeah because because for me it's a lot but i think i can almost see a path but i'd like mm. to hear more oh dear um also that <laughs> yeah I, I this is a this is a tough question i mean if if you are thinking about how 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 a part is regulated or what is let's say starting these let's say uh, parts of the dna that mechanism we do know, um, and that is uh, how genes are turned on and off and how they are regulated is also well known. Um, uh, and of course, that is a fact of uh, environment, actually. Uh, and it's also a fact of, uh, let's say, um, your everyday, let's say, what you are doing. Uh, so uh, twin studies, for instance, has shown that if you take two identical twins and you put them on two sides of the world, they would develop very differently. And that is due to the, the effect the environment has. And of course, the environment uh, will have an effect of what kind of uh, person you are going to turn to be and what kind of food intake you have. And uh, so on. And so that is... Um, that is also regulating what kind of proteins that you need uh, to survive in your everyday uh, life. <laughs> it's the same, it sounds strange, but it's actually proteins that are the, the functional, you know, uh, molecules inside our bodies uh, together with the cells. Um, and so, I mean, this is, this is very, uh, very strange, very, very difficult <laughs> uh, yeah. question, um, but coming back a little bit to um, uh, to uh, these epigenetics, I mean uh, the and going back to the sequences again and the information you have from the sequences. As uh, what I said a little bit, I think in the beginning or when I stepped into it here, mm. we do know what our sequence look like, but we don't know if this gene is going to be activated. Yeah. So even I, that is, that's the, the that's the thing coming back so, to so in a uh, way the, 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 the information. Yeah. The genome is a library, but we don't know what books are going to be taken out and, exactly. and, and how that cell is actually going to interpret that information. Exactly. Um, and it's a huge library. Uh, you could probably say how many genes are, are in a human genome. Uh, oh, I, I actually don't know. Okay. That's well, over my someone can, yeah. someone can Google <laughs> that and we can find out. But there's a lot, basically. There's more than 10. How many genes yeah. do we have? Yeah. yeah. A lot, a lot, Quite many a thousands yeah. of genes. So imagine that's a library. Of... It's a lot. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes. Oh, God. Is with mm. this is what, what, what is a gene? <laughs> oh, do Which not go awesome. there, Rebecca. Um, so, yeah. I know, I know. But, oh. Anyway, let's uh, uh, let's, let's open 20, it out 20 to, to the 25, floor. 
Uh, yeah, 25,000 is a good number. Let's open it out to the floor then. Okay, so where do we want to go with this? Um, uh, the, you know, the level of understanding of something that complex is going to take many, many years. And that, in a way, that's coming back to our sort of opening question, which is what is the future of uh, sequencing? Um, but as you know, you came into the conversation, Daniel, saying it's not just about the sequencing, it's also about how you actually deal with that information and, um, um, and how you actually uh, compile what is, you know, huge amounts of data and, and, do, and do stuff with that data. Uh, Rahim, you've unmuted yourself. Were you gonna, about to say something? If, you know, what, what is interesting in the gene and DNA sequences is only recent uh, appearance in science. In 1950, they didn't exist. In 1940s, they didn't exist. Either. Yeah. So it's a lot of progress we have scientists has uh, done since when they knew the DNA sequences and all that. I think we should appreciate that. Okay, so that's a round of applause for science. Uh, yeah, uh, I think we should be um, we're, we're talking about, a, 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 you know, well within a lifetime, we've come from understanding just the shape of the molecule. Yeah. Secondly, uh, yeah. we're learning every day. Yeah. And you scientists, gender people, learning it. Mm. And that is a very good sign. Mm. And when we're talking about this uh, uh, gene and other stuff, don't forget that knowledge is start from zero, then mm. gradually you develop on top of. Sometimes they use, they call quantitative experience and constitute this turn to the quality. So therefore, my message to you, a person, it'd be nice to you can develop my hair here. Mm. Which is, that what we, is that what you would edit in your genome? Would be yeah. the... What I'm saying is, good luck to you. You should be proud yeah. of that. Okay, um, so round of applause for science again. But I mean, okay, we've we talked about the history. The, we also want to know about the future. Where are we going to go with this? In your opinion, you've you've seen the uh, the you know the discovery of the structure of DNA, Rahim. Where do you think we're going to go with this knowledge? Where where would you like to see it go as well? If it's the same thing, I don't know if it's the same thing. Can I ask you that? Where would you like to see the this uh, knowledge, this learning go? Okay, I'm going to leave, I'm going to park that one, um, but or maybe ask everyone else. Um, we are kind of coming into our like final thoughts uh, part of the uh, part of this talk. Um, I will want to, I will say to those people watching on Vimeo or on the swap card or on the Festival of Genomics site, whatever way you're picking this up. Um, also, yeah, if you want to give us a final thought um, to uh, you know, to sum up your experiences, write it into the chat. We'll read it out or come onto the Zoom. It'd be lovely to see you. Um, but yeah, there's a question there. Where would you like to see this going? And is it the same as where you think it will go in terms of our understanding and our knowledge? Um, anyone want to answer that question? I, I can kind of elaborate a little bit. Mm. Uh, I, I do agree with Katie. Uh, mm. that our, let's say, ethical standard will go down a little bit when the need for change is getting, let's say, dire. Mm. Um, and we have talked a lot about, you know, altering embryos and you know, this CRISPR-Cas9 and modifying the humans are a big no-no and there is an ethical part of that. And what I don't understand is uh, we are coming back to, oh, I think also Rebecca mentioned this with GMO, for instance, where we are actually doing something to uh, make crop better, to withstand drought and uh, pesticides and so, such uh, stuff like that. And that is the thing we cannot accept, which mm. is really something that we can eat or uh, give to our uh, livestock to, to uh, provide with food for everyone. That is something we say big, no, 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 no. We cannot tolerate GMOs, but mm. we can uh, tolerate, go in and, you know, play around with our DNA to prevent disease. Mm. 
mm. where we can actually provide food for uh, poor countries, yeah. underdeveloped countries, uh, in a very easy uh, way. And they also help, uh, you know, farmers in other countries where ha that has problems with drought and, uh, you know, uh, pesticide or these animals that uh, do damage the crops. So, so, so we have a little bit of a double standards, yeah, yeah. double moral. Okay, so we've got different standards depending on whether it's disease or starvation, whether I guess whether it's a kind of Western disease or a, you know, global South problem. Mm -hmm. uh, um, there's a couple of hands up. Roisin, you've got your hand up. Go on. I was going to say, I don't think it's going to ever stop. Like humans just want to know everything all the damn time. Scientists want to know everything. You mm. literally have like Frankenstein on your little picture behind you. People mm. don't stop. And yeah. I don't think you can get them to. But what kind of matters is who will have control in the end and so who will suffer and who will benefit of... and how we can regulate that. Who's got control of what? The knowledge? The, Just everything. The, everything. Okay, so yeah, it's all about control in the end. Do you feel it like always is? <laughs> do you feel like you're going to have control, or you're going to be able to have any power in this brave new world? If, if, uh, for want of a better word. Oh, me personally. Yeah. Um, I'm very science minded, so I just about understand what's going on most of the time. Just about. Mm. But I think yeah, having personal control is very, very important, which is kind of why the gene stuff I find a bit difficult because anything you're doing to people that haven't been born yet, mm. well, that's not them having control. So yeah. it's kind of like, I think I mean, you should have the ultimate control over your body, which requires yeah. a certain level of understanding of what's going to happen. Mm. And an embryo can't possibly have the understanding to give their consent. I mean, um, embryo, I don't necessarily consider a person, so there's other issues there, but still. yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, there's a, uh, well, there was a raised hand from Kieran. <laughs> You've not said anything yet, so welcome to the chat. Um, Thank you. Um, I just thought that, I mean, if we're going to approach this whole thing of genes and how we use them to better for benefit or good, then we have to take a more objective approach to it. I thought Daniel's version of GM crops was a little bit one-sided. I mean, the EU didn't ban it without any knowledge. Uh, they're cautious. Uh, we have seen super weeds come where things have, you know, where the, the, the whatever the genetic thing is modified. And we have also seen the situation yeah. where the soil has been completely depleted by, by, by making these super crops that can just grow in a Petri dish. And, mm. you know, the idea that, you know, we want healthy soil with worms living in it and, you know, something which we consider more natural to be the state of case and not the other way around, or just a sponge with chemicals going into it isn't necessarily oh it's brilliant is it it's like you know there's a little bit of a debate to be had before you can just say that um and uh, i mean but i think daniel's point is that we've erred on the side on 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 that side of the side of the the natural and the side of um of cautiousness rather than this opportunity of of you know of addressing the the issues of starvation or lack of food yeah, well, I think that that isn't necessarily true if you look at America and India and Africa. So I'm not sure what we're talking about here. Who, who's mm. Ed on the side of caution? I think it's full, fully pledged going going for it. So, and, sorry, Kieran, I'll let you finish. Didn't no, no, no. So that's it. And I think with the gene thing, you know, one of the things is that we're going to understand what switches genes on and what switches them off. It would be interesting to see if we play around with the, our environment or whether we just play around with the genes. I would rather it give us more understanding of how we got there in the first place and go gently. Mm. Okay. Yeah. What? Well, uh, uh, Are you getting yeah. a round of applause from Daniel? By applause. the way, I think I think I would like to just say to that, which is just what you said about like, should we, you know, should we think of the genes or think of the environment? You'd like to understand, which I agree with because that was actually quite where I thought you were going because. It depends on what actually what makes a difference to people's perception because if people's perception was it was all about your environment the idea of tinkering with someone's environment would be would be horrific you know if it was you know this many hours of sunlight and you actually tinkered with that people would be like oh my god you can't do that because what what of the consequences because you because the perception is that is the biggest biggest impact with change Whereas with genetics, there is a lot of gone, oh my God, we can't, even though we know there is all these interlaying systems and that maybe it doesn't actually have such a difference. Like like we've been talking about so much during the festival and in these talkie mm. 
how we've said it's not just about your genes and um, it's about you it's about your environment it's about how your genes are switched on and off it's it goes down to not boring but it goes down to the very mathematical like probabilities of what is the probability of this molecule bumping into this molecule at this particular time mm. so that's sort of just where i wanted to go because yeah. i think it is it, it, it's either Gattaca or it's um you know all based on putting chemicals into people mm. you know Jurassic, those are the two dysopians you're Jurassic going for Gattaca, i think we're talking about here on this that on this particular um so what about if those dinosaurs were graded according to their genetic mutations and valued uh, on how perfect their genomes were anyway that's for a different talkie okay we're coming to the end of this one so it's going to be time for final thoughts uh katie uh you've got your hand raised uh this is going to be the last point before the final thoughts so you get another chance to have your final thought but uh what's your point i, I, I was about i was about to <clears throat> try to manipulate your feelings to, to give me another chance for the final thought after this. <laughs> so thank you. Anyway, um, to respond to Daniel regarding GMOs, um, again, even if it's predominant opinion of public that uh, GMOs are bad, when uh, I've lived four years in India, and there, even in the textbook, they consider, they teach that GMOs is one thing that helps them feed the country. So people grow up with understanding that it's a great thing and a huge advancement instead of uh, that has certain risks instead of, you know, seeing the risks as the biggest impact and the benefit as something small. You know, for people in Europe, where it's, you know, everyone's pretty much well fed or at least has opportunities to be well fed, it's very easy, you know, to try to decide what is good, what is bad. For billion people there, out of which about half are starving, it's it's, it's much different choice. And okay. uh, and to come back to Roshan's point about uh, the 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 risk of it becoming, you know, only for the rich people, I think the current setup is the reason why it's becoming only for the rich people. Because once something is prohibited and the fine is the cost, it's essentially Appliable to with those who can pay the cost. So, so mm. if we can put, I mean, if we accept that it will be done anyway by the rich people, let's just lower that ethics standard so all of us can join in. Okay, so in a way, this kind of ethical framework and all the barriers we're putting up yes, it's, it's, it's are actually, actually increasing the costs. Yes. Like, uh, yeah, it, and it and, and uh, you know, yesterday we were talking about diversity and accessibility to genomics. Uh, Perhaps I, I, we're I, actually denying people accessibility by putting all these uh, ethical barriers and... Um, yes, like, I mean, imagine if someone could tell, you know, we are against DNA editing, but some doctors will, some scientists will always be there who will just want to do research because they're fascinated by it. So then a rich person can go and say, you know, I'm going to pay for all of your research because I have the money. Just, you know, make me immune to the disease or make me age twice as slow or anything of that sort. So mm. if, if we close it down, I think that is the reason why we have this discrepancy. Okay. Because, I mean, if yeah. vaccines were prohibited, rich people could still access it. But now since they're acceptable ethically for everyone, that's why governments are pushed to provide it to everyone. Okay, good point. Um, well, let's get some final thoughts in. Uh, and this includes those people. Uh, I am actually watching the chat um, as well. Where do we want to take this? What's your final thought? What could be the next discussion at the next Festival of Genomics? Um, it could be anything at all. It could be, oh, I just really enjoyed this. Thank, uh, thank you. Um, it's up to you, whatever you choose your final thought to be, but it'd be nice to get a final thought from everybody if you're willing to give one. So um, let's get some final thoughts in. Anyone want to go first on a final thought? Um, Jill, you were first there. Okay, oh, well, it's been really interesting and I've learned a lot from the experts. Um, I think gene sequencing can help people in the future in a, in a public health way in, in, in helping to combat diseases. And also a last point, I don't think GM and care for the environment are mutually exclusive. They can be used together.
Okay, so thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. So you can have GM and there's a whole GM debate there, where, you know, which we're going to have to say for another time. Um, but thanks for, for that final thought. Uh, final thought, anyone else? Rashina, I saw you uh, raise your hand. Have you got a final thought? I was going to say, yeah, Katie is definitely right. But um, yeah, in regards to my final thought, I think when you make it that you can change genes or GMO or things of that nature, it's it kind of obviously is a good thing if you can make people not sick anymore and you can provide them with food. Like really everyone should love those things. It's just a case of things being thoroughly tested and all the implications being found out. And that's very mm. hard to do. And when those things go wrong, who picks up the cost for that really? I mean, what about if the only way to test this stuff is to put it out there? I mean, where, where do we go? I think that's Katie's point. I don't uh, know. <laughs> Okay, that's for someone else to discuss. Yeah, each um, thing will be discussed when we get to it, I guess. Uh, well, that luckily there'll be more chances to have <laughs> Tokyoki either in its live form where you're all going to be sitting around these, this table or in this uh, socially distant remote form. Final thoughts? Anyone else want to give a final thought? Um, Simon? Simon O? Uh, yeah, first and foremost, I'll just say... I've had a fantastic afternoon. Thank you very much. Everybody has smashed it and I've really, really enjoyed it. And um, I think my very last thing that I'd like Sorry, to- Sorry, that was the wrong button. The pigeons, you can give me extra applause, all of that stuff is yeah. fine. All the sound effects. Um, yeah. My last cat amongst the pigeons would be that I was fascinated by Katie's um, points about how, you know, suspending or lowering the ethical kind of uh, glass floor might be, you know, crucial for us to be able to find out some of this stuff. Um, and I, I found myself wondering whether what, what do we have to do as a species to have a, a an entire a kind of a group which is tested upon so we can do controlled experiments yeah. for all of these things mm. to be worked could out? It be, could it be an island? It's a just fucking nightmarish, but maybe yeah. in the grand scheme of things, is that right? Mm. That's my, mm. my last cap, but thank you very much yeah. for everything. Maybe we could just like seal off an island like the Isle of Sheppey or somewhere like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah. Uh, do all the experiments. Um, and just see how things go there and just not let anybody on or off. Uh, that could be a way of doing it. Just a suggestion. Other islands are available. Um, any, any other final thoughts? Rebecca? Uh, I echo uh, Simon and Rashid that this has been a wonderful talk and we've gone, we've gone a long way from the future of sequencing, but in the end, maybe we haven't. Because mm. potentially it is all most of it is down to our genes so i just like to say again a big thank you for everyone who's watching and participated in this it's been great to get a <laughs> to get a mix of views um but personally for me i think we should we should do more and we should try we should be cautious but not afraid going okay. forward okay so proceed with caution is uh but is, not fear but not fear okay uh, any other final thoughts? Kieran, Rahim, Odds, Margot, Katie, Daniel, none of you have given a final thought. Katie, final thought? Well, this talk, like of all of these sessions, I, from the beginning, I felt that the topics towards the end are more and more interesting, at least to me personally. Mm. And considering the number of participants, it seems I wasn't the only one. And mm. uh, I just hope there'll be more talks uh, in regards to a lot of areas currently in science that mm. are affecting our future in a very profound way and now is the time to make the right decision and i, I believe that discussions like this mm. is the right way to make to, to find out what decisions are right because we can figure out the uh, criteria for deciding which is right which is wrong <laughs> Excuse me. Um, what are the what are the decisions that we need to make right now? Um, well, I, I, I think there's plenty. I mean, many had to before. Just give us an example of one. To get vaccinated or not. Okay. Right. So that's one decision. Uh, as a final thought, uh, Rahim, have you got a final thought? Just need to unmute yourself there. Uh, maybe I'll just come to Kieran and get a final thought from okay. oh, him. Yeah. Uh, final, yeah. final thought, we should get, a uh, government should put a lot of money in the science. Yeah. And, so more, and, okay. 
One thing, that's very important. And what about the climate change? Mm. Is any related to, you can work on that one and reverse it? I mean, do you think some of the arguments we were making about science communication could be kind of transmuted to climate change as well? Okay, well, that's a, that I'm going to throw that out to everyone, or that could be a, a, a different topic for a different day. Kieran, you, you wanted to have a final thought there? Uh, well, I think, I think, you know, sorry to bring it up again, but I think if the um, scientific community approach, you know, all the negative points with um, a kind of blindsiding and, um, you know, they don't stay objective, then we're going to have the same problems. We become very divisive. Mm. Um, you know, is it possible to be objective about an ethical question? Well, I think, you, I think you have to, Mikey. I think you have to look at what people's worries are and actually address them rather than just saying that's stupid or ignorant. Right. Or okay, so that's and what, yeah, most of the time it's yeah. not addressed because they mm. know more and they can't be bothered with it. It's yeah. never going to work. And then you'll end up with rules like the EU coming out saying no. So, yeah. uh, and I think climate could be the same thing. There's some quick fixes out there, seeding the ocean with iron files and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, we don't really want to just go down a road that we can't return from. And that's, that's the big thing. And that's the big okay. Fear, really. But I mean, I think that point about how do we, how do we, how do scientists actually take on public uncertainties, questions? Um, it's not just enough just to say you're stupid people. You have to somehow bring them into the discussion. Um, I think that's a really good point. And I'm, uh, let's just get some, fi some other final thoughts. Uh, we are actually kind of over time now, so let's just, but we still got time for these final, final thoughts. Anyone else got a final thought? Daniel, have you got a final thought? Well, uh, I just want to thank you all. This is a brilliant group. Uh, um, the thought I have is that uh, coming back to what everyone has said here before me is that we cannot stop. We, we need to proceed to understand uh, the genome and how to make use of it and not only for human but only also for of course uh, plants and uh, species in general to uh, to uh, to make you know the, this world a better place to endure disease to make a, let's say um, and withstand the environmental changes that may come so so I think this is crucial for us but of course it also needs to be controlled okay. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks you. for bringing your, your knowledge into this. Anyone else want to give a, a final, final, final thought? Margot and Odds, you've not said anything yet. Uh, last chance. Uh, I think, no, just really, really thank you for a very um, insightful session. Really nice to see lots of people with different perspectives, some scientists and non-scientists and just like general clever, pe clever people or curious minds. So yeah, thank you so much. Really enjoyed it. Keep the curiosity going. Uh, odd final, 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 final thought. Uh, I was pretty much going to say what Margot just said, so I guess I'll just uh, second that. Thanks for holding the space. Uh, I love the diversity of people. A lot of this stuff is way above my pay grade, so I've, I've got lots of food for thought. And I think the ripples from this stuff sometimes it's a few days later when it permeates, and that's when you get the full benefit. But thank you, I enjoyed okay, it. So so keep on thinking. Thanks, everyone. We're going to leave it there. Thanks to Rick for the visuals. Uh, thanks to Rebecca at Festival of Genomics. And thanks to everyone watching. It's been a really interesting session. Let's keep this discussion going. We will see you at the next Festival of Genomics. But in the meantime, you can look at the People Speak. Just Google People Speak London or uh, Talkioki, and you'll find out events happening uh, regularly. All, about all kinds of stuff and you everybody's welcome to all events so uh we'll see you there